we live a happy life? How do we live a fulfilled, uh, blessed life? You know, there's many books written in the last few years along the lines of how to live your best life now. And um, there's all kinds of answers that the world gives. You know, generate wealth for yourself, have have popularity, um, well-being, uh, have a really strong morality, you know, set goals and work towards meeting those goals, have a positive outlook, discover your true self. Uh, one book um, uh, phrased it, manifest your success. What does that even mean? <laughs> but I think the state of the world shows us that we haven't found the answer yet. The world hasn't got an answer to that question. And I would say actually the, that the Christian church has its own version of it. How do we live? How do we earn God's favor? How can we be blessed? Uh, we we um, have answers like, oh, if I work enough, if I do enough, if I live a holy life enough, if I um, pray enough, read my Bible enough, then, then that would be enough to be blessed. And this pursuit of blessing, this pursuit of happiness, uh, I think it, it tends to push us towards individuality, my happiness, my success. And how much, uh, how much does my happiness come at the expense of others? How much does my wealth come at the expense of others? How much does my popularity come at the expense of others? Now, in Jesus' first public uh, teaching in Matthew's gospel, he starts with this question. Who is blessed? Who is blessed? How do we manifest God's blessing? How do we live, if you put it this way, how do we live our blessed life now? You didn't get it, obviously. (laughs) I had to include that one. I'm sorry. Uh, So where are we we going? We're going to look at the, for those taking notes, we're going to look at the origin, uh, the outline, and then the outworking of the Beatitudes. So what we're looking at is, and what was read to us, is known as the Beatitudes or the, those that are blessed. So the origin. And what I really mean here is context. I just wanted to alliterate because um, uh, it is a sermon. And all it is to say, like in Matthew's gospel leading up to the Beatitudes, there's, it's chapter five. So there's all this other stuff that's happened. And um, the purpose of Matthew's gospel is to uh, demonstrate what the kingdom of God is like and to introduce Jesus as that king. At the end of his gospel, he sends the disciples out, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. The goal of Matthew is to, to make disciples, disciples of King Jesus. And Jesus' journey leading up to this teaching is kind of mirrors the nation of Israel, uh, the Jewish people, you know, a little retreat to Egypt, and then um, also the temptation in the desert. Also, his, um, uh, um, I was going to say analogy, his, his genealogy, uh, demonstrating that d- Jesus is a descendant of King David. And when G- the first, uh, first um, public appearance of Jesus, he comes out and he says, repent and believe the kingdom of God is here. And he gathers his disciples. He, he finds some disciples to um, follow him. Uh, and then a great crowd begins following him because he's doing all these amazing miracles and awesome stuff. And then he's, he goes up a mountain and he sits his disciples down, the great crowds there, and he begins teaching them. Now, some people say that this teaching is explicitly to the disciples, uh, but at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says, the crowd heard and said, wow, what authority this man teaches with. So the crowd is listening in. But Matthew makes a note that his disciples came to him. And so what's the point there? I think it's just to say that this teaching is for the disciples, but an earshot of the crowd. It's like the disciples are are sitting down to this course for for credit, for course credit, and the crowd is auditing. So what is the first, uh, yeah, what is, what, what Jesus comes to speak on is what is the nature of the kingdom of God? What does it mean to be my follower? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? 
And the first word that comes out of his mouth in this very significant sermon is the word blessed. Blessed. And what does that mean? On a very basic level, blessed means happy or, or celebrate, rejoice. Um, and and is, is that it? Is that the extent of what Jesus means? Well, no, there's, in Matthew's gospel particularly, there's layers and layers of, of Jewish heritage and history from the Old Testament. And if, um, if, you, if you know the story of the Bible, there's a significant event with, with uh, their forefather, Abraham, where God calls Abraham and he says to Abraham, I will take you out, I'll lead you to a land and I will give you, I'll make you into a great nation. I'll give you a great name and I will bless you and you will be a blessing to the nations. So God promises blessing, promises that Israel will be a blessing. And, um, and what is the nature of that blessing? Is it just that you know, God's people always just be happy, clappy all the time? No, it's much deeper than that. Um, the Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, made famous by, um, by the song, uh, The Blessing, released in um, 2000. We, and you know, COVID made it really popular as well as, as nations sang that song together on Zoom. Um, but number six says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. To experience God's blessing is to experience God's favor. His face is turned towards you, not away from you. It's to be welcomed into his family, into his people, to experience the blessing of God. It's to belong, to belong to God. Now, in, in God's kingdom, in God's world, who are the ones that are blessed? Who are blessed? Who earns the favor of God? And it's not who we think if we're left to our own devices. Is it the courageous, the wise, the just? No. Is it the agreeable, the funny, the intelligent, the attractive, the sensitive, the fit? No. According to Jesus, it's the poor, the sad the lowly, and the mistreated who are blessed, who have God's favor in God's kingdom. And so what we'll do, that's kind of the, the origin of the Beatitudes, the context. Now looking at the outline, we've got to have the slide with all the Beatitudes up. There's a few things to notice with the Beatitudes. The first is that each Beatitude has a subject and it has a promise. Blessed be the poor in spirit. That's the subject. For theirs is the kingdom of God. It's a promise. And um, uh, the, you'll notice the first and last beatitude have the same promise. For theirs is the kingdom of God. That's also the first and last are the only ones with a present tense. Theirs is. The promise is for now. The rest are future promises. Now, sometimes uh, we read these Beatitudes as uh, prescriptions, as standards to live up to. Um, if we live like this, we'll be blessed. And I um, have a confession to make. Is, uh, I, was, I was a bit idle. I didn't have much to do this week. That's not true at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, I uh, wanted to do an experiment, and I w opened up um, uh, ChatGPT. Does anyone know who that is, what that is? Yeah, a lot of the young people maybe, and tech savvy. It's an AI, an artificial intelligence. Uh, and I asked ChatGPT is, can you write a sermon on Matthew 5, 1 to 12? <laughs> <laughs> and look, it wasn't very good. It wasn't good. And you, I can assure you, I, I will never use something like that. Um, but what, and so the kind of concept is this is, you know, this artificial intelligence is bringing the, the information of the world and putting it through algorithms to, to give the world's answer and world's understanding. And it says, one of the things it said was um, to, to live out, to receive God's blessing, we need to ascend the Beatitudes like steps to heaven. That's what it said. And um, is that what Jesus is on about? 
Is that the story of the gospel that we need to step up and walk up to meet God? Or is it that God steps down to meet us? And I, I, would, I would put it to you that we need to stop reading the Beatitudes as standards to live up to, but see them as the conditions that God meets us in and the conduct that results of being a disciple of Jesus, of being in God's kingdom. Now, each one deserves its own sermon, but let's like just look at each one uh, briefly or as briefly as we can. The first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, someone might have everything, popularity, success, wealth, and everything is going right for them, but in their soul of souls, in their core, there is something missing. There's something still wrong. And that's being poor in spirit. And it's not, not being poor in spirit in the sense of being humble and, um, you know, recognizing that, uh, that, you know, we don't have much to offer. It's, it's a deep, deep need and a deep, deep deficiency. It's not poor in spirit. It's poverty in spirit. A reality that's, that's despite how much we might have or have experienced. It's not knowing who we are, not being able to hear from God, feeling alone, rejected, unworthy, being poor, in poverty, in, in the spirit. We bring nothing to the table. There are those in the world who have everything and there are those who have nothing. And Jesus says, those who have nothing, they are the ones who will be given everything. They are the ones who will be given. Theirs is now, present tense, the kingdom of heaven. Though they might have nothing, through the blessing of God, being part of God's kingdom, they have everything. The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, many say this means mourning sin and and suggest this is just having a concept of feeling convicted about sin. But it doesn't say those who mourn sin. It's describing mourning as a process of deep sadness, deep depression. And if anything, it's not just realizing that sin is a bad thing and that sin in the world is a sad thing, but it's talking about people who are so caught up in their own sin that they're oppressed by the shame and the the oppression and the depression and everything that comes with that. It's talking about people who are in a state of mourning, deeply sad, deeply depressed. And where is the hope of joy when you're in the depths of depression? How can a mourner become happy? And there's no way really in from within the cells, but the promise is that they will be comforted. That God is the one who will bring comfort and healing to the broken and hurting. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now this is actually somewhat controversial, in a sense it's argued over a lot, precisely what meek means. And uh, one... um, a common one is, is it's understood as power under control. So someone who has, has a lot of power but choose to restrain it for the sake of others. Um, and this quotes a psalm and, uh, and also Isaiah 61 and refers to words in there. And it's more likely to be taken as not power under control but powerless, powerlessness. Someone lowly, nothing to offer, no ability to stand up for themselves. No merit or, or ability in order to inherit anything for themselves. And you think of the, stake, the story of Jacob and Esau. There was Esau who was strong and powerful and the firstborn and had every right. And then Jacob who was weak, the weaker brother and, and, and didn't have a right to the, to the inheritance. But in God's kingdom at the time, and it, like which... Which son got the inheritance? It was the weaker one. And it's 
the powerless, whether by choice or not, these are the ones who will inherit the earth, who, to whom the earth will be given. Not to the ones with power, but the ones without it. To the meek. The next one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now imagine a famine where people are hungry and thirsty. What are they hungry and thirsty for? Food and drink. Yeah, that's right. It's not a trick question. What is not available to them? Food and drink. That's why they're hungry. That's why they're thirsty. Hungry, being hungry and thirsting for righteousness is, is knowing that righteousness is not here yet. Knowing something is wrong with the world and being, being hungry, being famished to see something happen. Being hungry that, and, and righteousness, um, uh, the, the, the word is very closely tied in the concept of there's righteousness and there's justice. Righteousness in the sense of being right with God and justice in the sense of being right with the world. They're, the word's pretty much translatable to either of those ideas and concepts and almost they're one and the same. And so hunger, being hungry and thirsty for righteousness is, is the hunger of, of, am I right with God? Am I right with God? But also, is the world right? Seeing the injustice in the world and getting angry about it. Jesus says, they're not the ones to fill themselves, but they will be filled. They will be filled. Righteousness will come to them. Righteousness will come. Now, these first four conditions um, of being poor, being sad, being powerless, being angry, discontent, these are the ones that are blessed, that are favoured in God's kingdom. These, these beatitudes, these, these ones, they express our dependence on God. It's not our ability or status that earns our, our merit, earns God's favor, but it's his grace. They express our dependence on God and the promises express his provision, his provision. And if that's the, the condition uh, and the extent of God's grace shown to his disciples, well, then what's the resulting conduct how do dis disciples behave? And then how is that behavior rewarded? And the next one is, is the next four beatitudes refer to dis the conduct, beatitudes of conduct. How do disciples behave in the kingdom of God? What kind of behavior is honored? Is it the dominant, the fighters, the religious, the, the elite? No. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Those who show mercy, unmerited favor, the same kind of favor that God shows us. And how we treat others is the standard for how we will be treated. We treat others with mercy instead of harshness or dominance. Being merciful, being concerned for their well being, even at the expense of our own. They, we too will be shown mercy. The next one, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. This is not just talking about emotions, being, being purely affectionate towards God. The heart in the Bible isn't just um, the center of emotion, but it's the center of the being, the center of the whole human being. Um, uh, one, one writer says it's the center and source of the whole inner life. And Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Now, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Or you could translate it, the clean in heart. Psalm 24 uses the same words. Verse three and four, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He or she who, who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift their souls to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. A pure heart is a heart that is not impure. I know that makes this quite obvious, 
But it's worth saying, a pure heart is not distracted or tainted or corrupted by other things, by other idols, other desires, the selfishness that creeps in and sets our inner life away from God. And there's, there's a great warning here to guard our hearts away from the things that might take us away from God. And that might even be good things. Good things can distract our hearts, our souls, our, our whole beings away from God. And if we set our hearts on pursuing God, if we set our hearts on a whole being of pursuing God, of seeking God, of hearing from God, of living for God, then the result is we're given our heart's desire. We get to see God. We get to see God. One of the greatest promises uh, in these Beatitudes. The next, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Now it's not just talking about kind people, but talking about peace ma- peacemakers, people who create peace. It's not peace breakers or peace fakers, not dominating and demanding to get a result or not fleeing and forgetting and, and running away from it, but moving towards people, drawing in, going closer to achieve peace. Now this takes sacrifice. It takes courage. It takes trust. It takes humility. But this is what God is like. And that's why the peacemakers will be called the children of God. God is a God of reconciliation, of restoring relationships. And we are entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. The next beatitude and the final one, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. How do we respond to persecution? How do we respond when people um, ridicule, call us names, um, reject us or disfavor us? We miss opportunities because we're part of the kingdom of God. How do we respond? The, this is the only beatitude that Jesus kind of expands. In 11 and 12, he said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How do we respond to persecution? Um, in January, I went to uh, the United States to visit my brother who's studying at Gordon Conwell. We did a course together on world missions and part of that was looking at the history of missions. And we looked at one particular missionary called Hudson Taylor, Hudson Taylor, who um, started the China Inland Mission. Uh, there was a lot of missionary activity on the uh, shores of China and he um, felt a call from God to go inland to reach the unreached groups. And uh, that was met with, with all kinds of responses and, and, and really, like, in, in a lot of ways, a lot of success and a lot of activity. Um, but the opposition uh, to uh, the missionaries was quite fierce. Now, in amongst all the cultural wars and, and the, the global dynamics of everything, uh, China, as a government, actually had quite a favourable disposition to Western countries coming in at the time. And they had extradition treaties and, and, uh, and rules and laws that if, if any Western person or expats were to be uh, hurt or harmed or any injustice, uh, the, the countries could petition to the Chinese government to um, make restitution, to get, to get justice for that situation. Now, there was an event um, called the Boxer Rebellion, where a big coordinated effort of like, harsh persecution against uh, Christian, Christians and missionaries. And uh, hundreds of missionaries killed, 71 from, um, of, of uh, fathers, mothers, and children killed uh, from China Inland Mission. And Hudson Taylor uh, had to work out, how do we respond to this? Do we petition the Chinese government to 
find restitution for this? Is that how Jesus responded to those who persecuted him? And no, they said, no, we won't seek retribution. We'll seek reconciliation. We'll extend grace to those who killed our own family. And many, and maybe even all of the missionary families that were affected, they stayed to continue serving the Chinese people. And Hudson talked about how that was part of his experience to be to experience what it's like to be like Christ, to receive persecution, but to respond like Christ. And what a joy that was. What a joy that was to grow him closer to the God who was persecuted for his sake. Now, these are the Beatitudes. That's the the outline of, of the Beatitudes. There's kingdom conditions. God's favor rests with the poor, the sad, the weak, the angry, the discontent, and kingdom comfort. God's people, they, they show mercy. They're pure of heart. They're peacemakers. They endure persecution. If I were to summarize the Beatitudes, it would be this. God's blessing comes to the lowly, and God's blessing flows through his people. This is not a list of criteria or checklist or test to check off but a a beautiful portrait, a beautiful picture of what a disciple is. This turns the world's narrative upside down. How do I live my best life now? What do I need to do, achieve, and whatever? What Jesus says, how do you live your blessed life now? How do you receive God's blessing? Well, he gives it to you. Through his grace, through his love, and through the person of Jesus. How, is, how are the Beatitudes outworked? How is the disciple transformed? It's through the work of Jesus. And it was fascinating to think um, through the story in, in Matthew's gospel and through the story of Jesus' life, Jesus became all these things. He gave up everything to become poor in spirit. Jesus mourned when he, when he saw Lazarus had died He wept, bitterly depressed and and, and sad about the state of the world and the death of his friend. He was meek, powerless, born into an incredibly humble situation, a poor situation. He hungered and thirsted, thirst for righteousness. He got angry when he saw uh, his father's house, which was to be a house of prayer, was a den of robbers, a place of injustice. He got angry about that. He showed mercy to those who were crucifying him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. He was pure in heart, entirely focused on on seeking the Father, on obeying the Father. He was a peacemaker. And gosh, was he persecuted. He was persecuted. He did all these things and he died and he rose again so that through him, we could be blessed. The promise given to to Abraham and the promises that Jesus gives now in the Beatitudes, Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. He is the vehicle through which blessing comes. And this transformation that comes in the life of the disciple comes from the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And this is the framework to read the rest of the Sermon on the Mount with. It's not like here's a a standard we have to live up to, and if we fail, we're out. But it's a description of what a disciple looks like. And it starts at the lowest place, where Jesus is taking us as we are and transforming us through his spirit as we listen to his teaching and become his true disciples. It's not a standard to live up to, but a path to walk, a kingdom to be a part of. And the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is an outworking of what it means to be a transformed disciple. And this sermon is is kicking off a series in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We also have... um, uh, Bible studies for life groups or for personal study to, the, to con- go through together studying 
What does it mean to be a transformed disciple? What does the Sermon on the Mount have to say? And how can we listen? And how can we obey? Now, I've, I've learned, I haven't been a pastor for very long, but I've learned that Christians actually really struggle with the concept of grace. The, the idea that God's favor to us is completely out of our control. That we don't have any part to play in, in terms of earning God's salvation. And I often um, talking to people, people say, I can't see how God could love me because I feel so poor, so empty. I don't hear him. I can't see how God could love me because I'm so guilty, so caught up in sin. I can't see how God could love me because I'm not doing enough. Or the flip side of that, why, is it, why doesn't God love me? Because I'm doing so much. And to all those people and to everyone here, what we need to, to listen to, what we need to hear and understand today is that you are blessed in God's kingdom. That Jesus loves you and he died for you and he rose again and he gives you new life, a blessed life. And that is his work, not yours. So you can rest in that. You can take a deep breath. Like, oh, it's not up to me. It's, it's not up to me. It's all Jesus' work. And that is why um, we're going to uh, celebrate communion together. And we'll do it slightly differently to what we normally do. I'll have uh, people at the front to actually give out the communion, to hand out. And I just want us to really remember that the gifts that God gives us through Jesus is something we receive. Something we receive. We don't earn, we don't take, we receive. And so reading from, from Matt, later in Matthew's gospel when Jesus established this practice that Christians do. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, and broke, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body. In other gospels, this is my body broken for you. And he took a cup and when he given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That is what Jesus offers. His blood shed and his body broken so that we could go from being lowly and sad and discontent with the world to being blessed, being fulfilled. So if Nigel and Libby want to come up and Move this other way. What we'll do is we'll set this up the front. And as you come, we'll actually hand you uh, the elements, the bread and the wine. Not the wine, the grape juice. Um, maybe one day. Uh, <laughs> but as you come, like take a moment to reflect. This is God's gift to me. This is something to receive that he offers and even if, uh, even if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, um, this might be controversial, but perhaps you'd come to and receive and think about what is it that Christ offers? His life, the forgiveness of sins. Reflect and pray and think about these things. Mm-hmm.